Hello, everybody. Thanks very much for joining us. I'm here with Brent Alvey of uh, Complete Canine Care and Fallen Star Bloodlines. So Brent is a trainer. You are what? A national levels IGP helper, and you're also a breeder of Malinois. So we're going to get into all of that. Brent uh, is also a friend of mine. We've known each other now for what? About probably, I guess we've been working together for about five years. And then yeah, uh, it's been a while. I think I met you probably about eight years ago at a at a seminar, and and we'll get into that because I want to talk about my first uh, my first meeting with your boy Rex. I think I still have the video. <laughs> you sure do. Uh, is there anything that I missed that people need to know about you before we kick off? Uh, no, that's it. No, um, complete kind of care is all of our uh, our main stuff. Doing the uh, baby modification, obedience, and just everything with pets, and then our Fallen Star Bloodline is always our breeding program. Aim for um, you know, police dogs and dogs that can compete in any um, sport application, as well as, you know, some are good for some pets as well. So today, our conversation, I think, is going to is going to focus mainly on the breeding side of things. We've done uh, if anybody's yep. did, we've done some some training conversations in the past, some more kind of just general working dog conversations. We did a podcast a while back with uh, Rod Petrovic of Viking Canine Canada as well. So there's some other stuff there if, if you guys are more interested in the, the training side of things. But today, for anybody who's really interested in breeding, I think that's what we want to focus on. Both Brent and I are working dog breeders. Um, and that for me is is our main focus. And for Brent, uh, I know you're you're more focused sort of on the training side. And then you also have a, a big focus on the, the breeding as well. The first thing that I wanted to to talk to you about is you like a different kind of dog. The dogs that uh, that I know that you've owned are not the typical dog that even your yeah. working dog handler would uh, would own. So tell us a little bit to start out with about your preferred style of dog. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> where to start? Uh, for me, I like. I like a dog that's going to um, make you regret having him on some days when you're not up to it. Uh, I like a dog that's a little bit challenging. Um, it's strong character. So uh, for me, I, I like a, a larger size Malinois, uh, bigger body. So weight wise, it'd be the easiest way to describe, you know, an 80 to 90 pound Mal. That is athletic. You can't be um, a cow and not be able to jump. You know, I want them to be able to do a six foot wall such as in the KPV program to do that um, in the long jump. I want them to be athletic, but I want a larger dog. I prefer more, quote unquote, a man stopper type dog. Um, it's not for everyone. Um, it's just what I personally like as a dog. Um, I like a strong character. So a dog that's not always the most biddable, easiest to handle, you know, um, the dog that you have to make sure they, you know, you have to be fair with and they understand um, the training with them. You have, you really have to do it a certain way. Otherwise, if some people that I know can be a little heavy handed, it doesn't go so well. You know, those dogs have the character to, uh, to fight back if you're being unfair. So you have to be fair in your training, which in turn makes you a more skilled handler as well as the, the big thing I like is a big grip. You know, I like a, a dog that comes out naturally biting very, very full, very, very hard, very, very strong pushing grips naturally that's a characteristic I like. I, I like a dog that's confident everywhere it goes. So environmentally, you know, slippery floor, stairs, dark, anything like that. I want it to feel very comfortable there. Um, I, I, I want a good hunt drive. You know, I want kind of everything that you'd want in, in a, we'll just say a police working dog. And of course, you know, you're going to have variations of that. So if you're picking your own dog, you're going to have to do the plus and the minuses of each individual dog. But for me, you know, that's just a very strong character dog. It's not always the best type of dog to make you look real, really, really good. Like, you know what you're doing? Because some of those dogs that are real biddable and you're just like, hey, don't do that. And they're like, OK, no problem. We'll never do that again. You know, those dogs you can really make good videos of and show how good you are for training and are probably the best high level sport. But for me, I've had some and I just get so bored. I just get so bored. And I'm like, well, that was easy. What next, you know? And um, I just like a dog with a little bit of spice to it. And uh, I don't know why. I don't know why, but I just enjoy it. It, it gets me excited. 
Um, you, you see them working and they have this, they go to 11, you know, most dogs that go to 10, they go, they go to 11. They have this little extra gear, especially when there's more of a fight in the um, working dog aspect, they, they just turn up more in volume. They like it. And that's what I really like. And that's what I like to own. And that's what I look for in a breeding dog as well. Even if it's something I don't own because it's overseas, that's what I'd be looking for in a potential stud or female, um, down the road. So let's talk, let's talk Rex for, for a second. Um, Rex yeah. being, um, I guess you're kind of, I'm not going to say first ever dog along those lines, but cert- certainly the one that I guess got you better known, uh, you know, online and, and the one that, uh, I came to know you, uh, as having and, and Rex's son, soul leader. So for those of you who may have seen a previous podcast that we did, uh, with Rod, Soul Eater is being paired with, uh, yeah, he's uh, behind Brent right now. You can see his head poking out there in the picture behind Brent. Soul Eater is is a son of Rex and has been paired with uh, our girl Indy uh, Van Teeker Hook, and that's going to be a mixed uh, herder litter, which is Malinois German Shepherd Cross. We'll get into that in a little bit as well, but just to keep it sort of in in that line. Let's talk Rex. And and my my first impression of you uh, when I first met you, it was uh, the first time that I'd ever put on a bite suit. Again, this is, I guess, going back eight years now. Um, seminar put on by Haas at Shield Canine uh, and Canine Mike, Mike Nesbeth from Grassroots Canine. Uh, you came along, you brought Rex with you. And... I had never taken a leg bite before. I didn't even really know what a leg bite was at that point in time. And this whole <laughs> seminar, we'd been taught, you know, when the dog bites you, the way you mark the proper bite is by screaming. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, I've got all this you know, information in my head about, okay, the dog's going to bite me and I've got to remember to get my timing right on the screen. Well, it turns out that I didn't have to think about a thing because the scream that came out of me was, was completely natural. <laughs> And, uh, and, and as you said, it's on video, it's out there yeah. somewhere. You might even still have it. Uh, uh, yeah. I, can't, I, can't I would never it. let that go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't say it's my, my proudest moment as a budding decoy. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I can say that after that, I took dozens, probably hundreds of other bites from Rex and, and it never hurt any less, but the surprise wasn't quite the same after that that very first time. I kind of would describe Rex, and I have done before, as a, a, a tiger on a leash. Yep. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but that being said, you know, the thing that I found really interesting about him was that, you know, a lot of people would think about a dog like that, that, that is that aggressive and has that level of power and would think of them as being kind of a chaotic nerve bag type of dog. And Rex was the exact opposite of that. He always struck me as being just workmanlike in his mm. uh, in, in his biting and in his work in his work. Um, he he never came across like he was never a scary dog to work. He was always a dog that you kind of knew what he was going to do, and he was very clear in everything that he did, which I always found to be a very unique combination in a in a dog. So maybe tell us a bit about Rex and and what it was like kind of learning how to handle a dog like that. You mentioned a little bit before about how you have to be fair in your training. Go into a bit of detail about maybe the consequences of not being fair in your training, where that kind of, where that plays in, in those bloodlines. Cause I do want to start getting into a little bit more about those specific PNPV bloodlines and, you know, where you find those. Yeah, that's a lot to unravel there. Um, So Rex was actually my first male. Um, I have Kick-Ass, who is a Mal Bulldog mix, but Rex is my first Mal. And what I was doing was actually looking for a dog <clears throat> I could put to her eventually. But I was, you know, it took me about a year or two of looking everywhere to find a dog that, you know, caught my attention. You know, it just had a certain look about it, a certain way it worked, you know. And I was looking and looking and I was looking in Holland and whatnot from what I knew over there at the time. And nothing really stood out to me, you know. I seen all those those crazy KMBV stick attacks, and I'm like, that's cool, but I didn't have that extraness. And then I saw Rex one day, and I was like, that's the dog. That is the dog. I just that you know, you just see it and you know. And so I originally wanted to breed him to Rex to try to get something in, in the future. And eventually, I just asked if I could buy him, 
And the guy was like, yep. So we agreed on a price and everything. So I uh, had a friend, Ian, come with me and we drove down to the States to get them. And um, I didn't know dogs like this existed at the time. You know, I uh, got out of the car and we went down to the kennel where Rex was. And he was about 100, 200 feet away from us. And he looked at me and, and well, us and he scared the shit out of me. I said, well, definitely made me do a double step back. I did a double step back and I was like, holy shit, what is that? I've I never seen you, a dog. You just hit on something really important there that I think people should keep in mind as we talk about this. Hmm. Most people, and maybe a little different on this feed because we do have some more experienced working dog handlers, but the vast majority of pet owners don't know that dogs like this actually exist in the world. I like, didn't know, that's for sure. Fine spot. You were a working dog handler already and you didn't know, right? So, yeah. anyway, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but I, I just think that's yep. a really important thing for people to keep in mind. Yeah. Yeah. So that, yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't know it existed and I really haven't seen anything like that since. So I, you know, I did a double step back. He just had this presence about him where as a person, you know, you could be, we'll say for instance, like in a bar and someone walks in and you have your back to them and you feel really uncomfortable that someone came in and everyone's like, gets quiet and uncomfortable. And that person doesn't say anything. They just have that presence or that aurora about them. And, um, that's what he had. And I didn't know that, uh, that existed. And so, you know, I went down to the kennel and everything and I'm like, look, I just see this dog and uh, Rex is staring at me. He goes to one corner, stares at me and he pisses in the corner while, while staring. And then he goes to the other corner and does the same. And I was like, Oh, Oh damn. And the guy was with me. He's like, you know, you don't have to get him." And I'm like, well, we've already driven this far. So we brought him, uh, the handler, the owner at the time brought him out and I, you know, I worked him and everything and that was great. And we loaded him up and I, I went home with him. Um, and so we had an interesting 24 hours. That's another story waking up to him. Well, I'll tell the story. It's fun. So we got home. We had, a, I had a couple hours of sleep and I started letting some dogs out and the crate I put Rex in apparently wasn't very good because I heard a couple of my dogs bark and I opened the door and there was Rex standing in the hallway and this dog I've only owned for a few hours, who scared the shit out of me the first time I saw him, was loose in the house, uh, staring at me. And um, so I was like, lovely. And I shut the door and I'm like, what do I do? <laughs> I open the door no. again. And he looks at the hall, down the hall at me. And he just stares at me and goes, Rrr. and then I was like, oh, that's lovely. And I shut the door and I go, what do I do? And so I open the door again and I, I, Luckily, read up on my Dutch commands as he's a, a PH1 title dog from Holland. So I was like, I got to learn the Dutch commands. So that's and had before. That's the, the first level of KNPV. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Please dog one. And so I told him to lie down a couple of times. And then he lied down looking at me a little suspiciously. He was like, OK, OK. And then I walked past him and I opened up the freezer where I had a bunch of uh, treats for dogs. And I look over and he's standing up looking in the freezer at with me and I just tossed him a treat and it bounced off his nose and he's like growled at me again I'm like lovely lovely and so I uh, walked down the stairs and I managed to just pop a leash on his flat collar he had on him and then I was like hey Rex buddy oh pal like let's go in the crate I'm trying to get that running speed to kind of like make it all one big flow not not a no big deal and he just puts the brakes on every time and a couple of times walking past there, I had an IPO sleeve down there. The one I didn't use, I I got it. It was as hard as a rock. Like it was, I would never use it. And for some reason, he smelt that and he just, boom, grabbed the back barrel of it, you know, where you don't bite and just swallowed the whole thing with a full grip and then was walking around. And I'm like, shit, is he like one of those dogs that goes in the work mode and is like crazy now, you know, becomes a little bit unstable because of previous training or something. And I was just like, hey, let's be friends. I was like, good boy, Rex. Good boy. You got that sleeve, buddy, old pal. And um, I asked him to out a couple of times, and then I, I managed to get him in his crate. And I think that took a couple of years off my life. And uh, I'll never forget that. So uh, that was my first experience with him on my own. And I was like, okay, well, we're going to go for a big walk after that. So that's how we started a relationship was just – you know, the first two weeks was just go for an hour walk every morning, just on his flat. I didn't even use any other callers. I just wanted to build a relationship with him. And he was a very, very fair dog. Um, you know, if you were being unfair, he would let you know. Um, as, what would he do as to I, let you know? How would you, how would you know that you were being unfair? 
Yeah, yeah. So the first couple of times I was uh, doing healing with them, and I'm used to more of the IGP heal versus and the KMBV heal can be a little bit loose compared to some. And he was, you know, not so straight and everything. And uh, I didn't know enough about the sport at the time to know these rules. And so um, I went to correct him to make him a little straighter. And I just gave him a little bit of uh, low stimulation, I think, on the e collar. I think it was at the time. And he just looked at me. And um, I read that look loud and clear. <laughs> and I said, okay, we're done training for the day. And uh, we went for a walk. And for about 45 minutes of that walk, he was walking next to me and just was like, <clears throat> and kind of give me a look. And I was like, yep, yeah, I'm not going to pet you or anything. We're just going to walk and going to ignore you until you're happy. And about 45 minutes later, he calmed down. And, you know, he, he let me know that we were cool again. So it was one of those things, if you didn't, um, if you didn't read the sign and you did it again, might be bad you know he might he might make you learn not to do that and um so you had to be fair in that kind of stuff and uh, i learned um what to do and what not to do and definitely getting a dog that's titled and was definitely i later learned was trained a different way than i was accustomed to had i known the way he was trained i probably would have made life a little easier but it was again just not a style that i was familiar with i learned later on um so I learned with my own way and I, uh, I never got bit. We were always fine, but I definitely learned, you know, like there's dogs, you have a th certain threshold and if you push them, they will make you pay. And so you have to think a little bit differently and you can't use force mm -hmm. in, in that matter. Not that I was using force, but just, you have to be fair and not do that down the road. You know, it's really interesting because, you know, a lot of what we talk about from the training side is the ridiculousness of the whole force free ideology and everything else. Yeah. And, and how the, they paint this caricature of those of us who use um, aversive tools as being just straight up yank and crank trainers who are just, you know, trained with yeah. and all this kind of stuff. Right. And and what's what I find really interesting is like with a dog like like Rex that's that's just not even an option like you you can't yeah. do that. the the dog will hurt you if you try doing yeah. that so it's like yeah. it, it's just such a it, it's such a clear indication of the fact that like you know the the type of training that we do actually does work because it allows you to build the relationship that you need with a dog like rex like you can't have that dog in your house if you don't have an actual two-way relationship with the dog it's not him looking at you as being some dominant figure in his life it's mm -hmm. you know he he looks at you as a potential underling um who is currently in control but doesn't necessarily have to be yeah and with him is that you know you, you had to be fair and for him and in, in his bloodline which i learned later on mm -hmm. is definitely their characteristics are very and again these are the lines i use are very one man dog type dogs. So, you know, the person that raised them from a young age up would probably have a foundation and be able to do something versus, you know, the second owner that imported them could definitely keep, have the upkeep, but um, things could definitely go, you know, being let loose and, and let him a little bit more wild than he was being upkept with his original owner. And then me getting him at five being the third owner, you know, again, like, if I could do it over again, maybe I'd change some things, but we never had an issue. Our relationship was good. And he was a very, very fair dog. You know, he he had that aggression in the work. You know, he wasn't a dog that was going to just go up to everyone and be pet. He wasn't that social. But if you gave him a little bit of time and he liked you, you know, he would walk up and he could seek affection from someone else. As long as you, you were fair about it, you know, he could definitely accept other people. Um, but it had to be on his terms. You know, it wasn't something that he would just be a, a social dog and go up to everyone. He he looked at everyone and, and measured them up, you know, uh, at the an APA slash KMPV seminar I went to with him and uh, a gentleman then named Rick, who's been in Holland for 30 years at the top level dealing with these types of dogs. He's like, yep, this is a dog that comes out and measures every single thing up out here and sees where the pecking order is and he's above everything and he measures everyone up and gives them that look. So yeah, that's the touch on Rex without you know rambling on for hours about him is uh, the type of dog he was and the character he was. And he taught me, you know, a lot and um, you know, a lot more on how to deal with a dog like that in the future, um, how I could do even better. So let's talk about those, those bloodlines that you mentioned. So you got Rex down in the States, but he obviously, he wasn't born there. He was a PH one. He got his PH one um, overseas. Mm -hmm. And since, 
since buying Rex in the US, if I'm not mistaken, most of the mouths that you've ended up bringing in have been from Europe. I and mean, I think yep. closer yep. to probably Rex's actual breeder, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Can you tell us tell us a little bit about that, about the bloodline and then how you ended up building those relationships? I don't think people have a good sense of what it really takes to to bring in these kind of dogs to to Canada. Yeah. Uh, so Rex Rex's lines are his mother was from Holland. His father was from Belgium. Um, every dog I brought in has since been from Belgium, except for Evo came in from Germany. But the father, again, was from Belgium. That's the Guardian Bloodlines I use. Um, so I've been following a, a friend of mine, Paul Sleeks, from there. He's been doing this for over 20 years, um, using these types of dogs. They have this certain look, you know, that I mentioned before, the, the man stopper. So a larger dog with a big natural grip. They have natural aggression to them, you know. They have that extra gear. So he, he's a gentleman that's been doing it for 20 years. And, you know, I've fallen in love with this type of dog, after, especially after I got Rex. And I had a lot of people reach out that knew about these lines, but they're kind of, they're hidden in certain aspects and not a lot of people have them. And so I, I learned a lot about them and that's that's all I want to go for. So, you know, a lot of the dogs I brought in now are, are from this breeder in Belgium. Um, and importing a dog is, you know, it's, getting the dogs the cheapest part it's all the transportation you know it's thousands of dollars that you're paying and all these fees and hidden fees just to bring a dog over so it's taken a while to acquire these lines and get the right kind of dogs for it. so so primarily i'd say the lines i'm using would be from belgium so nvbk lines but they uh, they do have kmvv in them you know the the gentleman's not um not using you know the the fci they have to be um, FCI and they have to be from this bloodline to use in the sport but they're more of dogs that are just meant for real world applications and then if there's a dog from Holland that can do that then you know he's going to use them um, or if the dog's from Belgium and he's going to use that but basically he's looking for the certain types of dog and that's what I'm doing as well as I'm just looking for any dog that meets that criteria that I can use down the road um, so I've got a few dogs collected from from Europe um, that I think have the possibility of, of producing dogs similar to Rex. Um, so I've collected those dogs, you know, and I'll be doing that in the future as well. If I ever see a dog that really is stand out because finding them is few and far between. Um, a lot of dogs that are sought after now, and I understand why are very social, you know, they can do the work, but they're very social kind of like a happy go lucky Labrador, but can do bite work. And, um, for me as a breeder, I'm always concerned that in 10 years, if we keep breeding that way, then they'll have no natural aggression and they're not going to have any dogs that can do the real work or at least breed offspring that can do real work, real world applications that don't need proper training. Um, a lot of these dogs, you know, you can show them a scenario they've never seen before and they can do it. You know, they don't need to be trained for every scenario and every which way. They're just able to do any work that you throw at them without proper, you know, quote unquote training to show them all scenarios. They just do it all because they have that natural aggression and character and dominance to them to be able to do it. Um, I think so, yeah. the, same, uh, the same concern exists in the in the German Shepherd world with regards to the overall <laughs> softening uh, of the breed. I think um, it would be it's important to to mention with the type of bloodlines that you have. These aren't bloodlines that you're going to find um, AKC registered or CKC no. registered. Um, these are. Tell me if I'm if I'm thinking about this the right way because I'm honestly not sure that I am. But the way that I see it. I equate the breeders that that breed these types of bloodlines more to uh, bulldog breeders where the the pedigree is held with the breeder. There's less focus on purity, purity, um, where yeah. you know, your bloodlines, there's German Shepherd in there back there somewhere. There's Dutchy in there back Probably. there somewhere. There's definitely you know, Dutchy, yeah. Yeah, so I don't know if there's German Shepherd or not, but there's something other than Malinois in there because they're 90 pounds. Um, <laughs> 80 or 90 pounds. Uh, and so it's less about in the in the German Shepherd world, the, there's a real purity, the desire for purity, I guess. Uh, yeah. 
certain to a certain extent to the detriment of the breed's working ability i would argue yeah on your side the there is less of that focus on purity more of a focus on creating dogs that can do the job that they're needed for and that is held more with the breeder than with any kennel club is that a fair assessment yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. For me, you know, I my goal in breeding is to have a litter and be happy enough that I would want to take something out of it personally for myself. That's my goal. And if people like the dogs I breed, you know, they're welcome to to purchase one for it. But I, I'm not breeding for commercial breeding. I'm not breeding for the dog that's going to be easy to sell. I know my dogs can sometimes be a handful, but if people like that, you know, they know where to come to get it. And it's more of a niche market, right? It's not as well sought after. And I understand that. Um, But I'm, you know, I'm breeding for myself and definitely I'm not doing CKC. I'm not doing FCI. I don't want anyone telling me what I can and cannot do. I don't want to say that you must do this. You must do this. The dog must look a certain way. The dog must have a title to do this. You know, some dogs, you could get a title on them, but it's a hell of a lot of fucking work and you need the right team to do it. And I don't have the right team to do it all the time. So I know what the dog's capable of. I can test the dog and I know that it should be good for breeding. And that's what I'm looking for. Um, I don't care about that paperwork. I think it's silly um, how it goes out there. I understand why it's there, but I just don't, I don't like anyone telling me what to do and that's just not going to happen. So let's talk and, titles. You, you mentioned titles. I, I want to just mm-hmm. get into that a bit because it sort of plays in a bit with the uh, the structures that that exist in the in the purebred world. So on the German yeah. Shepherd side, again, back to that purity test, it's very much a, you know, uh, if the male's not IGP three, he's not worth breeding. Um, yeah. And and I think to a large extent, I think it is probably a net good thing in terms of keeping some form of working ability existing in the breed, where in the German Shepherd breed, I would argue that most dogs don't have that working ability at all. So there's at least some of that coming in, but I think it's also maybe relied upon too much as a crutch where people will think that just because a dog is an IGP three, that it's worth breeding a or B that just because a dog doesn't have a title, it's not worth breeding. So my way of looking at it is that genetics are what makes the dog, the handler titles the dog, and the yep. title doesn't make a good dog. It's just a title no. put on a dog. Some good dogs have titles, some not good dogs have titles. It can tell it gives you information, but it doesn't give you enough to be able to make a decision in and of itself. That would be the way that I would look at it. Um, we're breeding Soul Leader, who is not a titled dog, to Indy, who is, she has a BH, not a title, but she could be titled without a doubt. Yep. And so could Soul Leader. So talk to us a little bit about that. Why is this not an unethical breeding? Well, there's a, there's a lot of things to touch on there. You give me so many things to go on. I have a hard time to remember on each one. I'm just pressing but, play. Yeah, so the title doesn't mean you have a dog capable of it. I've seen a dog that's going to worlds and has gone to worlds had really good training. I seen it as a young dog getting worked and I thought it was shit. I was like, that is a fear dog that shouldn't be on the field and it's going to worlds. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe it turned out better as it aged, but I think they had really good training and it showed well. I've, you know, there's dogs that with the right judge, the right field at their home time, just the right trial, they get their titles. But I've seen, and you know, on their score, I've seen like this is is up here, but then I've seen a dog that's superior in every way. That's an actual strong working dog, you know, take a lot longer to get a title. The score is much lower. And they're like, Oh, this has a score of 96, you know, and this dog has a score of 75. I'm like, yeah, that dog was 75 was a fucking powerhouse. And that was a really good dog where the other dog with the higher score was, not so good. And it just had a good day with the right judge. So titles and and points to me is it's silly. You need to see that dog and you need to see that dog off the field. You can have a dog that's really good doing its routine, bring it into a warehouse and 
do some work on there, even if it's still IPO sleeve work, but just make it somewhere where it's uncomfortable and see how it works. You know, when you're breeding a dog, these are all things that should be looked at and are often, often overlooked for some people that just look at the title. As you say, they look at um, what the scoring is and like, oh, that's it. You know, I've got 90 at Worlds. It must be good. And maybe it is. Maybe it's not. You know, that's something that should be tested by other people that know how to test dogs to uh, to do that. So I bet people that would... actually ask me for the the scores of the mother of one of my litters to which I'm sort of like what are you trying to what are you trying to get out of that? At the end of the day the yeah. score on the dog is is a reflection of the handler as much as it is the dog and then handler and trainer. Oh, uh, you have a good trainer yeah, and a good and handler. And uh, it doesn't tell you really anything about the quality of the the pups that are going to be put out. I mean, we had, just as an example, we had, you've actually worked her, one of our previous dogs, Senta uh, La Roja. So she was out of world famous dog, Cuvito, Vepiden. Uh, grandfather was Chris Spodlazov, both WUSB, uh, WUSB, excuse me, uh, dogs. And she was as point dog as a point dog can be she hmm. had zero active aggression and just we ended up getting rid of her just because she wasn't what we were looking for for our breeding program and then oh, yeah, yeah, I, ended up hearing, yeah. I ended up hearing the same thing out of a sibling to cuvito a dog named Bordy blendy i heard from multiple people who bred that dog that they had the same issues out of the puppies and both of those dogs were dogs that went to worlds and that did very very well at worlds yeah so to talk to us a little bit about what you see as the difference between a sport dog which for the record there's nothing wrong with people breeding sport dogs uh they are an easier type of dog to handle and a lot of people really will do better with a sport dog if we're being very honest but tell us what the difference is in your view between a sport dog and the type of dog that you're trying to breed in your kennel we're trying to breed in our kennel which is more of the working dog side of things yeah. and there's a lot of overlap we need to say there's a lot of overlap yeah. between those types of dogs yes yeah, so i wouldn't even call it a sport dog i would just say i'm very biddable easy to handle a dog because yeah. quote you know rex has a ph1 certification we could say is a sport but he can you know is a very strong dog and he can do any application i think you put forward you know kick ass has a sporting dog title i igp2 but you know i could do any personal protection type scenario and she's nailed everything I throw at her. So I wouldn't say like sport dog. I just say often can be labeled as a, a more easy, easy, biddable dog. So, you know, a, a good dog is a good dog. It can do sport or not do sport. So just to, Let's you know, I want to just... let, let, let me, let me clarify that. What I meant to say when yeah. I was sport dog was a point dog. Gotcha. So talk, you know, talk to us, I knew what you meant. I just wanted to yeah. break it down so that, yeah, yeah, we're going to think later on. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, a point dog, and uh, again, it's good. Some people want that. Some people want a point type dog because their main goal is the sport, IGP or PSA or um, you know French ring, KBV, Mondial ring, etc. So they want a certain type of dog that's very biddable, easy to handle, and it just they can go to worlds, they can title well, and that dog can do that well, and that is totally fine just not my thing. You know, I want the dog that's probably never going to go to worlds. You can get the title. It's just, it's a hard dog. You know, you have to say no a thousand times and it might test you on trial day. For me, that's better for worse. Maybe a breeding dog. I just like that dog that has that strong character, a little bit dominance. It wants to do what it wants to do. And I think that if we keep breeding very biddable dogs over and over and over that after many generations, we will lose that natural aggression and everything is just a game of, you know, IPO or PSA. I, I, again, can, that dog views it as a game. And they can still maybe even do police work. But, it, you know, again, you water it down so much. And I don't know what the end result will be after 20, you know, 20 years of, of breeding that way. And so I think that you need to bring in some dogs that have that extra spice, that extra character that are maybe not always going to be good on the field. Because no matter what, they give you the finger on trial day. And those dogs usually, usually are able to produce dogs that are able to do real world applications that can still do sport and everything like that with the right training. But if you have your bar set high, it's easy to, even if your litter doesn't come out exactly how you want it, they're still really good. 
And th- but even if they surpass him, then that's even better. But if you start with your dogs down here, a quote unquote point dog, and they get even worse, then you know where does that go? They might get a little bit better, and that's good too. Dogs with the active aggression coming out of the yeah. dog nearly as fr- it's what we always say: breeding dogs is a trip to the canine casino. We're always gambling yeah. in one way or another. Yeah. What we're trying to do really is minimize the range of outcomes and the yeah. way we minimize that range of outcomes. I look at breeding as always a deleterious process. So you're all, you're almost always going to come out with a little bit less than the dogs that went in. Some dogs are mm. going to come out. Some dogs are going to come out. Even the occasional one is going to come out better. And most are going to come out a little bit, a little bit less than. Yeah. And Equal so, to or less than. Yeah. Yeah. And so I would, uh, in, in my view, the dog that is good for breeding for the breed is not necessarily always the dog that is good to own. Yeah. Uh, the average person. And most of the time, the dog that is good to own is not worth breeding. I think those are are fairly true statements. Yeah, I think of, they are. And, and sorry, what your goal is too. Depending on what your goal is. If you're trying to be yeah. breed pet dogs, uh, yeah. then you shouldn't be breeding German Shepherds or Malinois. First yeah, all. and I think with like the touch on the German Shepherd that you went on earlier, again, is, is they're looking at scores. They're looking at the title, which to me doesn't mean anything. And some sports like IGP keep getting a little easier all the time with every new name changer. They keep changing stuff to make it easier, um, which I don't think they should, right? We should have a standard and that should be it. We shouldn't make it easier to get titles. We should make it harder to get titles so that we can get the dogs that can do all the athletics parts of it that we can't, we need them to do and do everything else. It's like rem- removing the stick hit in IGP has kind of really left me sour, You know, me as a decoy, that's where I was really able to show the difference in 10 dogs that are lined up is where I can put pressure on them. Some people have other parts they're really good at. For me, that's where I felt I shined was when I did my drive. I could put that pressure on the dog with my stick and giving them the stick hits. You know, I've seen dogs run off the field when I do it. Some dogs really change their grip and show they're insecure and some dogs kind of growl at me and go, oh, you want to fight? You want to do it more, right? And I'm like, that dog that's biting harder and kind of gives me that, mm, like, not a nervy growl, but like, okay, the game is on. You know, that's that's the stud dog for me. That's the dog I'm looking for that's bringing out that power. When I apply pressure to it, it fights back harder. Versus the ones that let go, run away, or just their grips change. Or some that are like, you know, you've just been really conditioned, but they don't have the heart in it. And removing the stick is definitely, for me, made it harder for someone to judge a dog um, if it's good or not for for breeding in that particular sport. So, you know, that's another thing with that particular sport. And that's what primarily German Shepherds are in. Um, will definitely water down what you're seeing, and what you're picking from. I think that that's actually part of what. So you're actually the the person who introduced me to the Teaker Hook bloodlines that we've now yeah had the, the very good fortune of of taking on uh, from Tiger Hook out of Holland. And from what I remember, that was one of the things that had impressed you. You'd either seen them or you had worked them. And the, yeah, that- there was one I had worked and I just remember he ran into the blind. He was a young dog and he was just like, rah, 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 like just jumping, barking at my face. And I, I got the feeling from him, like if I f- had flinched, he might have grabbed my arm or something. I'm like, I like him. You know, he had a little... <laughs> A little oomph to him. He just had a lot of drive and he had a lot of, it seemed like natural aggression. And he's a dog that you could put into something else besides IPO or IGP. You you could do your KMPV with that kind of dog. You could do a, a PSA with that kind of dog. You could do police work, real, real applications with that dog. It was different. It was different. And I liked it. And so I was like, when you asked me about German Shepherds, I'm like, I worked one I really liked and that was him. <laughs> yeah, and that set me off on the whole path. I went and uh, found out everything I could about the bloodline, fell in love with it for the exact same reasons. And here we are today, three yeah. years later, and we've brought in almost their entire breeding stock to Canada now, which is uh, really it's good. Cool. 
thing. Yeah. It's nice to know that we're going to have some solid German shepherds in Canada for at least a little bit longer, if nothing else. Yeah. I'm move on to something that is, again, we talk purity tests. We've been talking purity tests for a little while now. One of the big ones is health testing. And yeah. talk a little bit about that because what I want to get out right away, right up front, and you and I both, I think, are on the exact same page on this. A healthy dog is paramount in terms of the fact that we want to breed working dogs and a dog that's not healthy is not going to work well. Mm -hmm. I think where things might break down is in the areas of focus, where people look and what people choose to keep out of the gene pool and why. And so I, I want to get your thoughts on health testing, important mm -hmm. or not important, and how does it factor into your breeding decisions? It's a touchy subject, touchy subject for some people. Um, you know, having a healthy dog is obviously most important. It, not most important, but it is important. That being said, x-rays are like something that every that is always done. You know, I've done them and it's fine. But if you have a dog like Rex, we'll say, and say his one elbow is not perfect, do you throw that away? Because you, I can't find another one. Or do you breed him to, we'll say, a female that is perfect x-rays, and then you check the x-rays of all their puppies, and they're all perfect. Well, then it wasn't genetic, you know? And often... I have friends over in Europe that deal with a lot more Malinois in, uh, in Holland and that. And, you know, they've been doing their x-rays for years. And the dogs that don't pass x-rays don't get bred. But still, four generations later, six generations, multiple generations later, they have a dog that still doesn't pass an x-ray. So if it was just genetic only, then they, those other, all the dogs should pass. You know, if you're four or five generations deep with perfect x-rays and then a litter has two that don't. Maybe that's not really the, that's not really showing you everything. Um, so sometimes some dogs that are very, very good are overlooked because of something didn't pass, even though their offspring pass. I, I've been on some breeding forums before and I, I try to stay away from forums because it's, they're silly, but there is some good information. And I, I seen someone that was breeding new fees and they had two perfect parents and eight out of the 10 dogs had dysplasia of some sort even though the parents were perfect. And then they bred one dog that had like mild in the elbow and all puppies were perfect. Shouldn't happen like that, right? If it was if it was a, a perfect science, it would never happen like that. But I, I keep seeing it, it's not. It's not a perfect science. So yes, I, I do check, but if the dog is a, a tier, you know, tier one dog, showstopper, a Rex dog, and something's not perfect, I would still use him. I would just let people know, hey, okay? This is him. I did an x-ray. This is the results. I don't know if it's environmental or from birth. I don't think it's from birth. I think it may be something else, but um, this is it. And I'm letting you know beforehand because I think he's worth breeding. And so as long as I'm honest and upfront about it, I think that's very fair. And if all the puppies have the same issue, well, then okay, maybe we don't breed him again. But if none of the puppies have the issue, well, then obviously it wasn't a genetic thing. And um, I, I know a dog in Holland I was very interested in, and apparently his x-ray was not good, but he was bred before that twice, and all the puppies from, all the, from both litters are perfect. And, you know, and he wasn't. So I don't know. It's a, it's a, if science was perfect, we'd have an exact answer, but you got a lot of people that will look up their nose at everyone else if they haven't done the exact same testing they have done, even if... Again, some dogs that are being bred are maybe healthy, but I think they're not very good. I think that they're a nice pet that I would own, but not a working dog. Even if they had a title, some of the dogs I've seen that are using for breeding and they're healthy, but I don't think they have the right character um, for me to be bred for the Malinois or the German Shepherd, and they are. And, you know, sometimes some people are really good at social media and some good people are really good at talking and they sell these dogs um, very easily. It's not my strong shoot shoot um, social media uh, and being a camera is not my strong suit. So, you know, something I'm working on, but uh, you know, that, that some dogs I have that I thought is a pet quality dog. And I don't think it's that good mm. is better than the dogs that are being bred. I've seen. I think the way to think about it is that 
it's one factor among many other factors and where people yeah. get themselves into trouble is when they start thinking that breeding is a univariate situation where we're dealing with you know one variable and as long as the health testing is there well let's go you know we're good to breed right or if the yeah. health isn't there then we're not good to breed and the fact of the matter is that it just if we're trying to breed for performance for something specific it it just simply it can't be that simple it isn't that simple and uh so i think the important thing is that as you said the x-rays are being done it's not a matter of of doing it uh, going into it blind uh soul leaders had his his x-rays done he's fine it's mm. not a matter of of going into it blind and not knowing you know closing our eyes and plugging our ears and la 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 la, la. we're just going to stick two dogs together and hope everything turns out okay yeah you want to have as much information as you possibly can if there's something wrong with the dog whether genetic or not, you want to know about it because you want to be able to factor that into any decision that you're making. It just can't be as simple as this is one thing that isn't right, where a hundred other factors are right. Some of yeah. them being even more rare, like the temperament that you're, that specific temperament that you're looking for is incredibly yeah. rare. And it doesn't come about, Tell me about it. <laughs> yeah. So if you find a dog that has that temperament, well, you know, now you, you've got some decisions to make at that point. It's just not, it's not a simple thing. And I think as, uh, as a result of people thinking of it as being just a cut and dry thing, a lot of very good potential dogs are being held out of the gene pool as a result. I do yeah. want to be clear if this is not to say that, you know, if you have something like DM where we know, you know, if you breed an NDN dog with an NDM dog, you're going to get a bunch of NDN pup or you're going to get a bunch of DM DM puppies. So puppies that are actually expressing DM, those dogs should not be bred together, just full stop, right? Like there's certain things where you just make that decision where it's just like, we're not, we know exactly how the genetic, the genetics work on that. And we're not going to go that route because we're not willing to produce a bunch of dogs that have, that have DM. Mm. Right. Whereas if you've got an NDM dog and you breed that dog with an NN, so it doesn't carry DM at all, you're going to have zero dogs in your litter that are going to express DM whatsoever. And so there's no reason not to breed those two dogs together. But if you don't actually understand how those things work, uh, you, you're, you're going to end up making incorrect decisions is that fair yeah yeah that's why i say when you when you brought it up it's a touchy subject um you know a, a lot of people have their their views on it and they talk to everyone else but they um some people are not open-minded to even discuss the pros and the cons it's just everything must be perfect and if it's not then get rid of it and again if you're looking for that unicorn dog there, there's a bunch of factors that you need to put into place and you know, if they don't meet it, then they don't meet it. It's fine. But you have to put all the pluses and the minuses and, you know, weigh that out before you make those choices. Um, and just being over here is is, is tough in, in Canada. Like, you know, you've had to and I've had to. We had to import our dogs over from Europe, um, which is a fucking fortune. And, you know, we're not in the place where there's you can go for a half hour ride and go look at, you know, 10 different Malinois. You know, it's just not possible. So, you know, we have to be really picky when we're picking the dogs we want to use um, to do that. So, um, you know, we put a lot of effort into getting the right dogs. But, um, yeah, again, over here, it's very, very difficult. There's more German Shepherds over here than Mal's, but... Um, yeah, but most of them are shit. So there are really... <laughs> yeah, there, there's some good ones. There's some good there's ones, but there's also a lot of not good ones. Yeah. So yes, it is a very touchy subject. I wanted to touch on it though, because I think it's important. I think it's a really important subject that I think that we as working dog breeders need to be more comfortable speaking openly about because yeah. it's not a matter of not doing the health testing. The health testing should absolutely be done. Mm. We'll stop. It's about how those results are interpreted. And I would argue that most people don't necessarily interpret or use the results 
in the way that they, or a lot of people, maybe not most, shouldn't, yeah. or in a, in a way that they, they, they use the results in a way that they ne shouldn't necessarily be used. Yeah, I, I think that's all really good information. And the biggest thing is I, I always keep an open mind because again, I, I, I see dogs that I think are pets, but they're working dogs and they're being bred. I, I don't care. I just say that's just not for me. That's not where I would get my dog from. And if someone's looking for like a, maybe a, a drivey pet, maybe I refer to them, you know, I'm not opposed to that. Everything has its place. It's just there's a lot of people out there that if they're not breeding the type of dog that they believe in, they should talk everyone. And that's just something I'm not going to do. So I think that's a good takeaway is that we, you know, you do everything, but you need to have open conversations with every other people um, and not be so quick to jump to, um, you know, what they believe is the right dog. It should be an open conversation and go back and forth an open dialogue, I, I think is definitely what we're doing now. Talking about these dogs is, is often seen. If you look online is those dogs are shit. Those dogs are shit. And, but you know, there's a, maybe a good place for them. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. The open conversation when it comes to that is key. I can't think of a post that I put up online that got me more hate than the one that I put up that said that if the first thing that you're looking that you're looking at when seeking a working dog is their health test, then you're looking at the wrong thing first or something along what those lines. I say I, I, subject. <laughs> I, I, I worded it a lot more uh gracefully uh <laughs> in my post. But yeah, yeah, we got a ton of hate. It was it was really misunderstood because it's yeah. not to say that it doesn't matter at all. It's to say that when you're looking for a working dog, there are a lot of things to consider. One of those things is health testing. But if yeah. the other things aren't there, then the health testing doesn't really matter. And if everything yeah. else is there and the health testing isn't 100% perfect, well, maybe the health testing shouldn't matter as much there either if you're still going to get eight or 10 good working years out of the dog that you're buying for yeah. reasons. Yes. Yeah. Again, it's always a... Uh pros and cons with every dog you know if you get a dog and he does everything perfect but he's a little sketchy of maybe stairs but everything else is perfect but you can do a little bit of training with him and he's okay then you know maybe he's he's good for for working right and, and using it's uh you got to look at everything with the dog the nerve the the character the grips your environmentals your recovery your hunt you know there's a long list of things to go down and you got to chalk them up to make sure it's what you want some people want more hunt than than other dogs so they don't care about the grip as much and some people want grip above all on secondary right so these are all just pros and cons and as a breeder you just say this is what i'm breeding for and if you like what i'm trying to produce then these are the dogs for you and if they're not then there's other ones that are trying to produce what you are so i think that's the biggest thing is just being really open with what you're trying to make and it doesn't always come out that way you know picking a puppy is the fucking hardest most stressful thing because i'm trying to make sure the right puppy goes with the right person to make sure everyone's happy but like a female I had in my last letter at eight weeks old, wasn't biting. She was very six weeks old. She seemed very not so confident eight weeks old. She seemed very confident, but wasn't biting. Wouldn't bite anything. I was like, mm, maybe she's a good fun pet at 10 weeks. She's engulfing the sleeve, just full mouth. You can't get it out. She's like, Oh, she's eating the whole thing at 10 weeks. And you know, if I had sold her at eight weeks and said, you know, she's not going to bite, she won't do anything like that. And then she turns on, right? And so putting puppies is tough. You don't know what you have till about a year. And so I just let everyone know, like, they might change for better or for worse. And I hate picking them out. I'm usually pretty good at it, but that one definitely threw me a curveball. <laughs> There's a lot of science in breeding, for sure. But mm. it's an art, if we're being honest. It's, it, it's an science. art that's bounded by science, is the way Stephanie and I talk about it. I call it science, art, and luck. Yeah. Yeah. The art part, I think, is where, I, not being an artistic guy, I, I'm just going by secondhand information here. But from what I understand, you're supposed to create art for yourself, uh, not yeah. what other people are going to think. And I think that that really, when you're breeding, if if you're breeding, you're breeding the type of mouths you like, I'm breeding the type of German Shepherds that I like. And at the end of the day doing that is going to help us produce the best possible dogs that we can produce. And if other people yeah. want to buy them even better, cause I don't have enough room for 25 German shepherds. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about one last thing before we wrap. And it's Perfect. every 
ethical breeders all-time favorite uh statement adopt don't shop so oh, yeah. every single uh, we're gonna get them on this video like without a doubt we're gonna get comments of people who aren't gonna watch to this point and they're gonna put something up about it every single video that i put up about breeding in any way ends up getting out and somebody puts up a comment stop breeding there's enough dogs in shelters already adopt don't shop so the first thing that i want to say is all of you go fuck yourselves where the hell do you get off coming onto our pages and telling us to stop doing the thing that we've dedicated our lives to doing but let's put that aside for a second why is that just completely misguided their hearts are in the right place, but they don't think things through. Um, I own rescue dogs. You know, I own a three-legged dog I brought back from Egypt. You know, I still have my first dog I got from a shelter. Nothing wrong with adopting. A good, good thing about adopting a dog is that they're probably going to be over a year old or close to. So you kind of know with what you're getting. And you just want a pet that's going to be your pet and your companion. You know you kind of what you're in for. It's character, roughly. It's perfect. You want a dog that's been health tested. We know the lines of the dog, so we know the characters that should come out on it. If it's going to be more of a dominant dog, that's going to have a little bit of a natural aggression, and that's what we want in the dog. Well, we're not going to probably find that from the rescue. Really hard to find that. We want a dog with the certain characteristics we like as a dog that we want to own for the next 10 to 15 years. You're going to go to a breeder and you're going to hope it's a good breeder that's putting the right dogs together, that's going to match you up with the right puppy, that's going to give you the dog, that's going to make you happy for those years. Because also, if you want to do a little bit of sport work, you want to do some protection work, you want a protection dog, but you're probably not going to get it from a shelter. I'm not saying it's not possible, it's just the percentages are against you and it's much harder. That's why people in law enforcement are not going to go to shelters constantly to get dogs, even though they, it can happen. Don't get me wrong. They're going to go to a dog that's probably from a breeder or a vendor that's been raised and you know what it is. Like it's a strong dog. It's probably not the best pet. It's going to have the character that you want. So going to a breeder is essential if you want, you know, the kind of dog you want and they're going to match you up and you're going to that breeder. Cause again, you, Jamie breed the German shepherd that I like. I like that German shepherd. I like the way it works. I like the way it looks. It has all the character I want. I'm going to you because I'm not going to find that in the shelter. And even, even I look around, I'm probably not going to find it. So there's nothing wrong with adopting and there's nothing wrong from getting a breeder. Both are good and both should be out there. And as well as any good breeder like yourself and myself, I'll take back my dog. You know, you have your dog for a bit. It's not so good circumstances turn against you you lost your job you lost your house no problem bring her back you know what i mean like we'll take our dogs our dogs don't end up in shelters so we're not part of the problem we're actually preventing it from failure. i honestly i can't think of a bigger failure than if i were to learn that a dog that we produced ended up in a shelter it would i would yeah. be, i would be gutted i would probably drive to that shelter and and get that dog out myself it, yeah it would, i've always told everyone i'll bring him back just let me know. And if you're having some issues, like maybe I can help you before you get there. Just exactly. be communicative. Just talk to me. <laughs> so just before we wrap, let's mm. talk quickly about the soul leader in the litter. Yeah. I decided that this would probably be a, an interesting pairing that it could probably throw some good puppies. I've already given my thoughts on it a bunch of times. Curious to hear what you have to say about it. What What are your thoughts? What are you kind of, expecting what are you hoping for and we'll bound all this by saying as with all breeding we don't know what we're going to get we could get the best of both worlds we could get the worst of both worlds but i think given the dogs that we have we've got a pretty good shot here so i'm just interested to hear what you have to say about it i think like in any breeding unless they're really tight line breeding you're going to have your top three and then your worst three and that will vary i think with these both of them are good dogs i think you'll get a ton of drive with these dogs so you should get drive for days. You should be getting a good natural bite, good full natural grips. They should be pushing, maybe a little pulling with that shepherd in there. I can't fix that. That's not good for I'm just, just giving you a hard time. Um, I think they should be pretty confident dogs. I think they'll be dogs that can go to, you know, police work or protection sport work. 
Um, as well as I think you will have someone there that'll be good for like an active family that wants to, you know, we can warrior stuff. So I think you'll get a little bit of variety in there, but I do think the majority of the dog should be confident, should have tons of drive, should be loud and barky, should, uh, have big stupid ears that you love. Um, I think they should be environmentally sound. There better not be any fucking long-coated German Shepherd mouth. (laughs) Anything that I've had from from down from Rex is I never I haven't seen personally or heard of personally having environmental issues. So we should see that um, they should have good hunt. I think there's a lot of pluses in it. I think they will be good dogs. Um, there might be one or two dicks in it, but the rest should be pretty good and pretty fair. And that I think they can do anything. Yeah, I think that's I, what I, we're hoping for. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. I think the 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 hope is that Indy brings a bit of the uh, German Shepherd thoughtfulness where Soul Leader is going to bring sort of more of the Malinois forward aggression. And, you know, hopefully the, the rest of the traits combine. Again, we won't know what we get. We're going to we're gonna get a mix of everything, like you said. Yeah. I think the bottom line is we've got two really solid dogs from extremely good old bloodlines. Yeah. It'll be yeah, a- so later lines are, are old, man. Like all of his stuff and Rex's stuff is fairly like uh, you know, Rex's grandfather was from 1990, you know. So yeah, and Coos before old. he passed away, and we were able to bring in his dogs Nina and, and Zavi. Uh he had been breeding German Shepherds for 50 years before that. So there's yeah years worth it's of- a lot of thought in these lines. There's a lot of thought. I don't even think people know the half of it, to be honest with you. So hopefully this conversation has served to shed a bit of light on some of the thought that goes into that. Is there anything before we wrap? Is there anything that I didn't hit on that you uh, that you want to touch on? No, I, I think we covered everything, covered everything enough. Um, I think that was good. I think that was good. So why don't you tell people where they can find you, Complete Canine Care, and Fallen Star Bloodlines? Yeah, Um CompleteCanineCare.ca is our, our training page. Uh, Fallen Star Bloodlines. We have a .ca, .com. We have a something. We don't use it. Just reach us on Facebook or Instagram at Fallen Star Bloodlines. Those are what we primarily use. Um, again, it's you know it's, it's our hobby. So um, you can find us on there. And then Complete Canine Care is um, Facebook and Instagram as well. We're on there um for all your dog needs and breeding needs is the fallen star bloodline perfect well look thanks very much for taking the time it was uh, great to chat and i will see as always in a couple weeks Uh, two more uh not this saturday next saturday i'll see you again fight club we'll get uh stupid furry years on the suit again yeah he did fantastic last time so i think we can do even more that's another dog out of Indy. So she's produced one so far. It's a, it's a sample size of one, but he's he's shaping up to be a good dog so far. He's very nice. He's very, very nice. Thanks a lot, Brent. Really appreciate your time. No, thanks for having me, Jamie. Take care. Great one.